This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Mutual Aid, A Factor of Evolution by Peter Kropotkin Conclusion If we take now the teachings which can be borrowed from the analysis of modern society in connection with the body of evidence relative to the importance of mutual aid in the evolution of the animal world and of mankind, we may sum up our inquiry as follows. In the animal world, we have seen that the vast majority of species live in societies and that they find in association the best arms for the struggle for life, understood, of course, in its wide Darwinian sense, not a struggle for the sheer means of existence, but as a struggle against all natural conditions unfavorable to the species. The animal species, in which individual struggle has been reduced to its narrowest limits, and the practice of mutual aid has attained the greatest development, are invariably the most numerous, the most prosperous, and the most open to further progress. The mutual protection which is obtained in this case, the possibility of attaining old age and of accumulating experience, the higher intellectual development and the further growth of sociable habits, secure the maintenance of the species its extension, and its further progressive evolution. The unsociable species, on the contrary, are doomed to decay. Going next over to man, we found him living in clans and tribes at the very dawn of the Stone Age. We saw a wide series of social institutions developed already in the lower savage stage, in the clan and the tribe, and we found that the earliest tribal customs and habits gave to mankind the embryo of all institutions which made later on the leading aspects of further progress. Out of the savage tribe grew up the barbarian village community and a new, still wider circle of social customs, habits and institutions, numbers of which are still alive among ourselves, was developed under the principles of common possession of a given territory and common defense of it, under the jurisdiction of the village folk moat and in the federation of villages belonging or supposed to belong to one stem. And when new requirements induced men to make a new start, they made it in the city, which represented a double network of territorial units, village, communities, uh, concerted with guilds, these latter arising out of the common prosecution of a given art or craft, or for mutual support and defense. And finally, in the last two chapters, Facts were produced to show that although the growth of the state on the pattern of imperial Rome had put a violent end to all medieval institutions for mutual support, this new aspect of civilization could not last. The state, based upon loose aggregations of individuals and undertaking to be their only bond of union, did not answer its purpose. The mutual aid tendency finally broke down its iron rules. It reappeared and reasserted itself and an infinity of associations which now tend to embrace all aspects of life and to take possession of all that is required by man for life and for reproducing the waste occasioned by life. It will probably be remarked that mutual aid, even though it may represent one of the factors of evolution, covers nevertheless one aspect only of human relations. That by the side of this current, powerful though it may be, there is and always has been the other current, the self-assertion of the individual, not only in its efforts to attain personal or caste superiority, economical, political and spiritual, but also in its much more important, although less evident function, of breaking through the bonds, always prone to become crystallized, which a tribe, the village community, the city and the state impose upon the individual. In other words, there is the self-assertion of the individual taken as a progressive element, it is evident that no review of evolution can be complete unless these two dominant currents are analyzed. However, the self-assertion of the individual or of groups of individuals, their struggles for superiority and the conflict which resulted therefrom have already been analyzed, described and glorified from time immemorial. In fact, up to the present time, this current alone has received attention from the epical poet, the analyst, the historian and the sociologist. History, such as it has hitherto been written, is almost entirely a description of the ways and means by which theocracy, 
military power, autocracy, and later on, the richer classes rule have been promoted, established, and maintained. The struggle between these forces make, in fact, the substance of history. We may thus take the knowledge of the individual factor in human history as granted, even though there is full room for a new study of the subject on the lines just alluded to. While on the other side, the mutual aid factor has been hitherto totally lost sight of. It was simply denied, or even scoffed at, by the writers of the present and past generation. It was therefore necessary to show, first of all, the immense part which this factor plays in the evolution of both the animal world and human societies. Only after this has been fully recognized will it be possible to proceed to a comparison between the two factors. To make even a rough estimate of their relative importance by any method more or less statistical is evidently impossible. One single war, we all know, may be productive of more evil, immediate and subsequent, than hundreds of years of the unchecked action of the mutual aid principle may be productive of good. But when we see that in the animal world, progressive development and mutual aid go hand in hand, while the inner struggle within the species is concomitant with retrogressive development, when we notice that with man, even success in struggle and war is proportionate to the development of mutual aid in each of the two conflicting nations, cities, parties or tribes, and that in the process of evolution, war itself, so far as it can go this way, has been made subservient to the ends of progress in mutual aid within the nation, the city or the clan. We already obtain a perception of the dominating influence of the mutual aid factor as an element of progress. But we see also that the practice of mutual aid and its successive developments have created the very conditions of society life in which man was enabled to develop his arts, knowledge and intelligence, and that the periods when institutions based on the mutual aid tendency took their greatest development were also the periods of the greatest progress in arts, industry and science. In fact, the study of the inner life of the medieval city and of the ancient Greek cities reveals the fact that the combination of mutual aid, as it was practiced within the guild and the Greek clan, with a large initiative which was left to the individual and the group, by means of the federative principle, gave to mankind the two greatest periods of its history, the ancient Greek city and the medieval city periods. While the ruin of the above institutions during the state periods of history, which followed, corresponded in both cases to a rapid decay. As to the sudden industrial progress which has been achieved during our own century, and which is usually ascribed to the triumph of individualism in competition, it certainly has a much deeper origin than that. Once the great discoveries of the 15th century were made, especially that of the pressure of the atmosphere, supported by a series of advances in natural philosophy, and they were made under the medieval city organization, once these discoveries were made, the invention of the steam motor, and all the revolution which the conquest of a new power implied had necessarily to follow. If the medieval cities had lived to bring their discoveries to that point, the ethical consequences of the revolution affected by steam might have been different, but the same revolution in techniques and science would have inevitably taken place. It remains indeed an open question whether the general decay of industries which followed the ruin of the free cities, and was especially noticeable in the first part of the 18th century did not considerably retard the appearance of the steam engine, as well as the consequent revolution in arts. When we consider the astounding rapidity of industrial progress from the 12th to the 15th centuries, in weaving, working of metals, architecture and navigation, and ponder over the scientific discoveries which that industrial progress led to at the end of the 15th century, we must ask ourselves whether mankind was not delayed in its taking full advantage of these conquests when a general depression of arts and industries took place in Europe after the decay of medieval civilization. Surely it was not the disappearance of the artist-artisan, nor the ruin of large cities and the extinction of intercourse between them, which could favor the Industrial Revolution. And we know indeed that James Watt spent twenty or more years of his life in order to render his invention serviceable because he could not find in the last century what he would have readily found in medieval Florence or Brigge, 
that is, the artisans capable of realizing his devices in metal, and of giving them the artistic finish and precision which a steam engine requires. To attribute, therefore, the industrial progress of our century to the war of each against all which it has proclaimed, is to reason like the man who, knowing not the cause of rain, attributes it to the victim he has immolated before his clay idol. For industrial progress, as for each other conquest over nature, mutual aid and close intercourse certainly are, as they have been, much more advantageous than mutual struggle. However, it is especially in the domain of ethics that the dominating importance of the mutual aid principle appears in full. The mutual aid is the real foundation of our ethical conceptions, seems evident enough. But whatever the opinions as to the first origin of the mutual aid feeling or instinct may be, whether a biological or a supernatural cause is ascribed to it, we must trace its existence as far back as to the lowest stages of the animal world. And from these stages we can follow its uninterrupted evolution, in opposition to a number of contrary agencies, through all degrees of human development, up to the present times. Even the new religions, which were born from time to time, always at epochs when the mutual aid principle was falling into decay in the theocracies and despotic states of the East, or at the decline of the Roman Empire, even the new religions have only reaffirmed that same principle. They found their first supporters among the humble, in the lowest downtrodden layers of society, where the mutual aid principle is the necessary foundation of everyday life and knew the new forms of union which were introduced in the earliest Buddhist and Christian communities, in the Moravian brotherhoods and so on, took the character of a return to the best aspects of mutual aid in early tribal life. Each time, however, that an attempt to return to this old principle was made, its fundamental idea itself was widened. From the clan it was extended to the stem, to the federation of stems, to the nation, and finally, in ideal at least, to the whole of mankind. It was also refined at the same time. In primitive Buddhism, in primitive Christianity, in the writings of some of the Muslim teachers, in the early movements of the Reform, and especially in the ethical and philosophical movements of the last century and of our own times, the total abandonment of the idea of revenge or of due reward, of good for good and evil for evil, is affirmed more and more vigorously. The higher conception of no revenge for wrongs and of freely giving more than one expects to receive from his neighbors is proclaimed as being the real principle of morality, a principle superior to mere equivalence, equity or justice, and more conducive to happiness. And man is appealed to to be guided in his acts, not merely by love, which is always personal, or at the best tribal, but by the perception of his oneness with each human being. In the practice of mutual aid, which we can retrace to the earliest beginnings of evolution, we thus find the positive and undoubted origin of our ethical conceptions. And we can affirm that in the ethical progress of man, mutual support, not mutual struggle, has had the leading part. In its wide extension, even at the present time, we also see the best guarantee for a still loftier evolution of our race. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.